Hello there friends and welcome for today's VG3 guide, it's once again all about Honor Mode, with the best party you can possibly have. So we'll be going with a truly stacked party for, well, the closest you can have to 100% win rate chance. As a matter of fact, our party will cover every single ground possible, starting with the best, amazing damage potential, with and without alpha strikes and ambushes. As a matter of fact, every single one of your main damage dealers in this party can achieve around 10 to 12 attacks total, and you'll have around 3 of them. It's not just about mid or late game power, because even as early as level 3, with your DPS characters you can already one shot and one turn kill even bosses. And this is exactly the type of game where I'm afraid the best defense is a good offense after all, you also have enormous initiative to easily handle all enemies, before they get to do anything at all. However, just to keep it safe, for the early parts of the game especially, we'll also be going with the classic tank characters to protect your frail damage dealers. And you'll combine everything with high AC, also enemy debuffs to attack rolls, so they'll have a hard time hitting your other party members, not just the tank, with, of course, healing potential, including the ability to apply the most important buffs automatically to all party members. And don't forget, everyone in this party will also be a spellcaster capable of damage or, most importantly, crowd control and debuffing spells. So without further ado, let's dive right into our best party for Honor Mode guide. And I want to start with our best damage dealer, who is meant to be the main character. And I must say that Bard and also Swords Bard is definitely still the way to go. It's always been one of the best classes in the game, but especially for Honor Mode. As a matter of fact, it is the class that has the easiest time completely bypassing the action economy nerf in Honor Mode that I've already explained in my previous Honor Guide. To put it simply, with a Swords Bard you can still get 2 attacks for every single action you have. That's 1 normal, a second from Haste, and the third from the Elixir of Bloodlust, plus another from the Fighter Action Surge ability of course. And guess what, you still have your extra attack on both the Fighter's Action Surge and your normal action, so as I mentioned before, it's a total of 12 attacks per character. And I know some will say, oh, but this does cost class resources like Bardic Inspiration, for example, while your fighter's action surge is once per short rest only, but guess what? Well, first, your Bardic Inspirations will be restored fully on a short rest as early as level 5 Bard. Second, the Bard himself also has an ability that increases the number of short rests you can make per each bard character. The end result is simple, you can still spam your most powerful abilities, well, as much as you want, because it's two normal short rests, plus one for each sword bard you have, and guess what? The more, the better anyways. You'll have four bardic inspiration, for example, times the amount of short rests you can perform. So for this party, we are talking about 16 to 20 times you'll be able to spam your double attack per action ability. It is certainly more than enough. Hell, you even deal higher damage whenever attacking the enemies twice. It's quite OP to be fair. Anyways, Swords Bard isn't just about offenses, you can even be good for utility through, for example, the Mobile Flourish ability that lets you push enemies back, including knocking them into pits or the Void for instant kills. And of course, Defensive Flourish for a huge boost to your armor class, although chances are you'll never need it. Bard is also an extremely versatile class because you are still a full spellcaster, and even though we'll be multiclassing so we won't get all the spells possible, you'll have more than enough, including of course heals when needed, Lots of utility spells like Long Strider and Speak with Animals, plus of course amazing buffs such as Enhanced Ability and debuffs or crowd control spells like Hold Person and the special Glyph of Warding that doesn't require concentration for the Sleep variant. And as if all of that was not enough, 
By virtue of having decent enough charisma and lots of skill proficiency potential, you'll be quite the beast at making dialogue checks as well, especially the many persuasion checks that let you, for example, force bosses to kill themselves or ignore some of the toughest battles while still getting full experience. Perfect for Iron Man, of course. Anyways, I can't think of any other class in this game for Honor Mode that's as stacked as Sword Spart. I actually have three here, which is absolutely ridiculous for Alpha Strikes. But hey, if you want to have a 100% win rate, why not go all out, right? The build itself is also pretty simple. I've already covered it in my main Sword Spart turret build that you can check to the side here. But I suppose I might as well do a quick recap here. For race, be sure to start with one that has dark vision, such as elf and half elf, ideally would half elf, because you also have higher movement and the ability to equip shields, which helps with your armor class and some other nice shield buffs and passives. Dark vision is very important, as I'll soon explain. For spells, I already have a best spells guide you can check, so let's keep it simple. Long Strider and Speak of Animals, you only need this on a single sword part. Healing Ward, on the other hand, is great for everyone, followed by Fairy Fire as a nice enough debuff. For abilities, Dexterity is the most important stat because we are a ranged character. It's just easier, especially for ambushes and alpha strikes. So start with 17 so you can get a plus 1 for 18 from the Hag boss fight in Act 1 as usual. Followed by 14 constitution as always for a nice amount of hit points. And 16 charisma for dialogue checks and also our spells. Like I said, you do have amazing crowd control and debuffing ones like fairy fire. For your skills, for the main character at least you want, well, all the main dialogue ones. So deception, intimidation and performance. Persuasion and insight can be acquired through the guild artisan background. Now, the good thing about this build as a sword spart is that it's been designed so every single level is a nice enough power upgrade. You'll never be bored while leveling your sword spart. Level 2, for example, means jack of all trades, for more skill bonuses, even in skills you aren't proficient in. But most importantly, Song of Rest for more healing and later synergy with our class resources and abilities. Level 3, of course, is a huge power increase because it's when we finally become a Swords Bard. Mostly for the range, slashing flourish, which lets you hit two enemies or even the same enemy twice. And you can spam it even on your extra attack prompts. For the second level spell, Cloud of Daggers is definitely the best early. And you can also replace an earlier spell for something like Enhanced Ability. Especially for the Eagle Splendor or Cat's Grace variant, which grants advantage on all ability checks for, well, dialogue checks, of course. Any other cantrip you want, Minor Illusion and Mage Hand can help. Followed by Hold Person or Invisibility, even. And of course, for our first feat, Sharpshooter is the must have. Considering how many attacks you have and the fact no this will get applied on every single one of them, including twice on your Bard Flourish abilities, well, plus 10 extra damage is huge. The attack penalty might seem troublesome, but one of the characters in this part will easily help you overcome that by forcing advantage, as I'm about to show you soon enough. Level 5 is also huge for a Swords Bard, because it's when we get to restore our inspiration on a short Rest, which means more double attack spammage, of course. For level 3 spells, Glyph of Warding is quite useful, the same for Hypnotic Pattern if you want. Level 6 is another amazing level threshold, because we get our second attack for the normal action and also the fighter action surge. And I'll be going with Hypnotic Pattern, because it can help, especially when you have multiple source parts. Level 7 onwards is when you definitely want a multi-class, ideally with Fighter first. Because first you get to pick a fighting style, Archery, for the huge plus 2 to attack rolls, which also helps you overcome the penalty from Sharpshooter. But most importantly for Action Surge, of course, during level 8. 
And as I said before, you'll still get an extra attack with this action. And it does restore on a short rest as well, so what's not you like? You'll still want to remain a fighter at level 9, so you can enter the champion subclass for higher critical range. And at this point, you'll start fighting a lot of nice critical gear. Now you have two choices, you can remain a fighter at level 10, so you can grab another feat. Otherwise, this character will only have a single feat if you choose to multi-class again. The main reason is to enter into Rogue so that at level 3 Rogue, you'll become a thief for the extra bonus action, which means an extra offhand attack. It's not exactly necessary, but, well, if you want to min max your attack spell round, <laughs> go for it. Because the benefit truly only comes at level 12, with 3 levels of it, you might as well grab a feat now, as Fighter 4, and respect into 3 levels of Rogue at level 12, of course. For the feat, either ability improvement and more dexterity, or alert for higher initiative. You can even specialize into more skills, ideally dialogue ones. And at level 12, we finally get the extra offhand attack due to more bonus actions. This is also great for the Mind Flayer powers. After all, they are at maximum potential during Act 3, especially Black Hole to drag enemies together. And you can use them as a bonus action as well. As I mentioned before, both my main character and Asterion have the exact same Sword Spart build, including as early as level 1. In the case of Asterion, however, be sure to focus into the sleight of hand and let's say stealth skills more than dialogue ones because you already have the main character for that. And Asterion does have a background that enhances his sleight of hand as any rogue for more, well, lockpicking and trap designing potential. Besides that, once again, Asterion also starts with Dark Vision by virtue of being an elf. Dark Vision is extremely important for the reason I'm about to show you at last. And it has everything to do with our third party member. I have Gale here, but it can be anyone you want. While bards are full spellcasters, they do not have access to the Fog Cloud spell, which is, well, one of the key to successes when it comes to hitting enemies even with the sharpshooter penalty for loads and loads of damage and high accuracy. Fog Cloud has always worked like this, as early as release and the current version of the game. It will automatically blind enemies inside, they cannot resist it, the only way to avoid it is to be immune to blind, and most enemies, including bosses, are not. Anyways, while the enemy is blinded, all of your attacks against them will have advantage, and this works for all party members, if they are attacking from decently close enough and have the dark vision feature, otherwise you will attack at disadvantage, which is why I say this is so important to have on all of your ranged characters. This is how you easily alpha strike everything into submission as early as level 3. Because when you combine advantage with, let's say, the blast spell from our other party member, your two hits chances go up to the roof. Now, as I said, bards cannot cast it by default. Therefore, for the beginning parts of the game, I'd rather not have our third damage dealer be a swords bard. Rather, you have a few different options. First, start with a class that has access to Flock Cloud, of course. My preferred pick early, so that you won't incur any delays in level and power acquisition, is to start as a Ranger. And you want to go with Beast Tamer for the Raven Familiar, which can also blind enemies. For favored enemy, you might as well pick Ranger Knight for heavy armor proficiency, which can be fun. For stats, it's almost the same as our Swords Bard. But besides the main character, for the other ones, you want to start with 16 Dexterity instead. 14 Constitution, Charisma won't matter if you're going with Ranger. And you can even go with 16 Wisdom. And the remaining points anywhere you want, including Strength for higher carrying capacity, for example. For skills, I'd rather Perception and Survival. But Nature is also fun for this type of character. Anyways, as early as the second level, Ranger does get access to spells. And one of them is Fall Cloud, of course. Which is why 
I'm saying go with one. The other spell can be anything you want. Just nothing that's concentration based, because Fog Cloud will take that spot already. Might as well pick your wounds. Ranger at the second level also has fighting style, which is great, because our swords bards, well, they only get it at around level 7 or so, but the earlier the better. Now, Ranger also has another amazing benefit for this type of party right at level 3, and ideally you want to go with Gloomstalker Ranger first, because you do get the Dark Vision ability for free, superior Dark Vision even, which can help someone like Gale as a human, he does not have Dark Vision for free, the same for others like Lazel, also will. The benefits don't stop there because the Dread Ambusher feature is also quite powerful. First, the plus 3 bonus to initiative means this character won't need the alert feat at all, so he can dive right into Sharpshooter just like the sword Spart. Second, the ability to perform an extra attack that deals additional damage is also amazing, even if it's just on the first turn of combat, because guess what? The first turn of battle is exactly when you want your Gale or whoever else you have, casting Fog Cloud on the enemies. That costs you a normal action, however, you'll still have the ability to perform two entire attacks even at that turn for a nice enough alpha strike. One of them normally through Dread Ambusher, and the other as an offhand, dual wield that hand crossbow attack. It is definitely a very powerful and quite efficient combination, which is part of why I really like having a ranger early anyways. The other spells can be anything you want. Because we don't want any delay in abilities and extra attacks, I would recommend you stay a ranger until around level 7. For level 4 it's the same as the sword spards, sharpshooter. Level 5 is also nice for a ranger because we have extra attack, something the sword spards only get at level 6. Another reason why I don't want to delay progression by multiclassing before this. Any other spell as well? Level 6 on Mars is when I would multiclass your ranger and it's the same as the sword spart. First with two levels of fighter, except now, because you already have archery, you want two weapon fighting instead. Followed by action surge at level 7. Now, from this point onwards, is when I would actually respect this character into a sword spard. Because we won't have to suffer any delay in abilities, as you'll be high level enough already to combine multiple classes together and still get the best abilities at once. Once again, because the Swords Bard will not get Fog Cloud, something else you can do is start with either Druid, Sorcerer, Wizard, or Cleric and the Tempest Domain Cleric, because they get Fog Cloud for free. I do believe Druid is the best one of them, because at the second level you can choose the Circle of the Spores subclass which of course provides you with amazing extra damage on both dual wielded hand crossbow attacks. So why not? Level 3 on Mars is when I would enter into Sword Spard, and it is essentially the same build. You can of course dump points from Strength and put them into Charisma if you also want to have high DC with your Sword Bard spells, including having no wisdom whatsoever. Level 8 is exactly what you need to have everything you want from Bard and also Druid. As this is when we get our extra attack. Now what about the next levels? Well, Fighter is still the way to go, I'm afraid. For both Archery, just like our normal Swords Bards, and of course, Action Surge, which has broken potential when you have so many Bards and Song of Rest for extra short rests. And I would personally just skip it to 4 levels of Fighter now, so you'll get an extra feat at level 12. But once again, it's Champion. And either more Dexterity or the Alert feat. It's just at this point, you have a lot of gear that boosts initiative. Don't forget your spell slots stack for both Bard and Druid, 
So you end up at, well, four level spells, which is more than enough for all the four clouds you want, or stuff like Hypnotic Pattern and Glyph of Warding. Now we still have our last party member, at least for our active party, which is Shadowheart as our classic Cleric, Tank, Healer, Buffer and Debuffer. It is essentially the same build as I have for my Shadowheart main Cleric Tank guide, because what can I say? It's an OD but goody and still quite efficient, and I can't really think of any other ways of improving it further. But for a quick recap, I might as well cover the strengths of the build again. You absolutely want to start with Light Domain Cleric. Because the Warding Flare ability is paramount in ensuring you stay alive as a tank, especially for the earlier parts of the game. With this you can force disadvantage on one enemy attack per round, and is amazing at avoiding both enemy hits and especially critical hits. When combined with good enough AC, you'll be avoiding most attacks, without a doubt. Fight. For cantrips, guidance, as it increases your chances of making dialogue checks, followed by resistance for the same purpose, and blade ward. You'll get light for free from Light Domain. For abilities, Dexterity is still very important for both Higher Armor class and Initiative, as this Shadow Heart will be our fastest character initiative-wise. Followed by 15 Constitution, I'll explain the reason later, but it will become a nice even 16 score. Then 16 Wisdom as your second most important stat. The remaining points can go anywhere you want, I choose Strength just for higher carrying capacity. Shadow Heart is pretty easy to level with this build as, well, you're mostly... Actually, you are a full cleric. The second level Light Domain is amazing as well, called Radiance of the Dawn. It hits a massive area of effect around you, targets enemies only, and the damage is quite respectable. Plus, later this has amazing synergy with inflicting enemies with the Radiating Orb debuff, which is what reduces their attack rolls against all allies. Our level 4 feet pick is very important, Alert. As you might have noticed, Shadow Heart is the only character in this party that will pick Alert early. The other ones have good enough initiative, and Gale as a Gloomstalker has a bonus that's similar anyways. When you have this and Shadow Heart's good enough starter dexterity, she will 100% of the time act before any enemy, which is paramount to ensuring your victory. Immunity to the surprise condition is quite good as well, there's for example a lot of ambushes in the second chapter of the game. And once again, if she's acting first, she is buffing the party and also debuffing the enemies with less attack roll potential. Might as well pick Sacred Flame here, doesn't matter. Speaking about her debuffing potential, level 5 is huge for a cleric because it's when you get access to Spirit Guardians. The Radiant variant is also amazing for debuffing the enemy's attack rolls by even higher than minus 10 when combined with Radiating Orb debuff gear, as I'll explain later. And yes, this will stack with her Radiance of the Dawn domain ability. So long as you have haste to cast both on the same turn, of course. Level 6 is great as well because it means improved Warding Flare, which lets you apply Warding Flare on party members to protect them further and even NPCs, plus of course more Channel Divinity charges. When, by the way, because they restore on a short rest, it's also amazing when combined with parts. This part is as stacked and has as much synergy as it can possibly have. For level 8, I definitely go with Resilient and Constitution, which is why we started with 16, so it will become 16 now. Having proficiency in constitution checks highly decreases the chances of enemies breaking your concentration which of course is very much needed for spirit guardians and well it's just more pure cleric levels for more spell potential until you get your last feat at level 12 ideally more dexterity but you can also go with more wisdom if you prefer now while we already covered all of our four main party members there is still a last party member we have to talk about, except this one stays hidden at the back lines only, so during your camp. And it is Brina Bright Song, our main potion maker and alchemist. 
Transmuter wizards in this game have access to the extremely useful experimental alchemy feature whenever you are creating either a potion or an elixir. By making a DC 15 medicine check, you instead craft two at once. Considering how many powerful if not even OP items you can craft in this game, including most importantly potions of speed for haste, and also elixirs such as bloodlust, the giant strength elixirs for higher strength, colossus for higher damage, even viciousness for higher criticals or vigilance for higher initiative. There's a lot of good stuff here. Well, having the ability to craft twice per each ingredient is simply amazing. So yes, the entire point of this character is indeed to just craft double potions. Don't forget, a lot of the ingredients are rather rare, like Warg Fang Ashes for Bloodlust, or Potions of Speed and Hyena Ears. So yes, it does help to have as high potion crafting potential as possible. This is how you can get, even as early as Act 1, 20 entire Potions of Speed, which honestly is enough to last you until Act 3. As to why go with Brina, well, as a halfling, she has the luck feature, which means whenever she rolls a 1 on an ability check, she can roll again and take the best result. And by the way, this will stack with the Owl's Wisdom spell that you always want to buff her with before getting into potion crafting. When you combine this with proficiency bonus and a good enough wisdom score, you will pretty much 100% of the time always craft twice potions per prompt. Now what about the build for her? It's pretty simple. You'll definitely want to start as a wizard, as you need two levels of it for the alchemist ability. The cantrips honestly don't matter because this character won't be fighting, pick whatever you want. The same for spells, but you might as well pick stuff that she can apply on party members if needed, like mage armor. Even if she stays at camp, she can still use it. Usually the ones that don't require concentration. Long Strider as well. But your bards already have it. Pick whatever you want. For abilities, Wisdom is of course your most important stat because it is directly tied to medicine checks. And we need to always pass a 15. So start with 16. Her other stats honestly don't matter. But you might as well have decent dexterity as well because she can be a good enough pickpocket. Or... Just leave that to one of your bards like Asterion, it's up to you. You can also give some intelligence for wizard spells, but like I said, it doesn't matter, she's just for potion crafting. Don't forget to, of course, get proficiency in medicine as your first wizard level, followed by whatever you want. For the second level, be sure to pick Transmutation, because it's the only wizard subclass that gets the experimental alchemy ability. Now, from level 3 onwards, you want to multi-class into either Rogue or Bard. The reason is simple for skill specialization, so you will have even higher medicine score by default. The Rogue class will get it at level 1, for Bards it's later. I do prefer Bards, however, because you have your Song of Rest, which grants you even more dual attack per action abilities to your other swords Bards. All you have to do is go back to camp and have Brina cast it. So that's up to 5 short rests you now have per long rest, with 3 sword bards and her. You'll never run out. Here we are, Song of Rest at the second level. Then level 3 is when you wanna choose your skills and grab specialization in medicine. The subclass can be anything. <laughs> Might as well be Swords Bard, even if she'll never attack. Now, for spells, this is pretty important. Unless you want to have someone else cast it on her, be sure to pick Enhanced Ability for the All's Insight variant, which means advantage on your medicine checks, thus highly increasing the chances of you always making them. Now you might as well return into Wizard, because why not? Once you get a feat, be sure to increase your Wisdom by plus 2, for even more medicine, of course. 
Oh, and by the way, for some reason, wizards don't get access to the enhanced ability spell. Even though they are supposed to, I believe, in 5th edition. I think it's an oversight. While it is true that the other levels don't really matter, if you remain a wizard with 6 levels, you'll also have the Transmuter Stone ability. This lets you create the stone, and you can give it to one of your active party members. The stones can grant either resistance against elemental damage, higher movement speed, dark vision, or, most importantly, proficiency in constitution saving throws, which of course helps you make concentration checks as you keep your most powerful spells on. The best part is, you can give this to other characters. So, our little halfling alchemist is really a nice enough character to support ourselves from the backline, of course. Now that I've already explained why this party is the best, let's just cover some gear choices. I often get a few questions about characters that are of the same type, so end up relying on the same gear. This is not a concern at all in BG3. I've said it many times, but for example, when it comes to your main damage dealer, so three swords parts here, they will all be going with dual wielded hand crossbows, of course, for the maximum amount of ranged attacks possible. The reality is, just one of them needs to have the best hand crossbows, such as Hellfire and the hand crossbow plus two. All the other ones, including the main character early in the game, can simply rely on hand crossbow plus ones, and by the way, you can easily farm multiple of these from even early merchants like Daemon at the Druid Grove or Roa Munglo at the Goblin Camp. It's also very easy to get them to restock their inventory, for example, by respecting characters, something you are bound to do early game anyways, or long resting. The end result is, even early on, you can definitely have 6 hand cross posts plus 1, which is enough to supply all of your characters. As far as the best gear, well, you definitely want it on your main character, such as Saravox Horn Helmet, the Rescue Ring, Callous Glow Ring, Broodmother's Revenge, the Knife of the Undermountain King for higher criticals, and I also rather enjoy the Sentinel Shield for a huge bonus to initiative, another reason why Half-Elf pays off. Once again, it does not matter if Asterion and Gale here won't have as high damage potential as our main character, because they still have Sharpshooter, which is more than enough, and up to 12 attacks. This is not the type of game where you need every single character having the ultimate damage possible. Hell, by just having the main character with this, you can easily destroy enemies. Whatever is left will be crippled and very weak. Easy, pray for Asterion and Gale. They can still rely on leftover gear from the main character, for example. Helldust gloves, also the flawed Helldust gloves. So you leave something like the Legacy of the Masters for the main character. Earlier there's also the gloves of archery. The Wondrous Gloves, which have synergy with Bard because of letting you acquire 5 Bardic Inspiration per short rest, and you know how many short rests we have for mass dual attack spamage per action. So as you can see, there's a lot of choices, including for accessories, for example, the Strange Conduit Ring and the Caustic Band, plus Sunwalker's Gift for characters that don't have Dark Vision later. Even amulets, you still have other good stuff, it's not just about Good Mother's Revenge, for example. Amulet of the Harpers for shields to avoid attacks. Amulet of Mrs. Stack, another amazing choice. For escaping when needed. Even armor-wise, you have loads of armors that are medium and have uncapped dexterity bonus to armor class. Even at the second chapter, you already have two of these, the 1T scale male, plus the Sharp and Snare Cuirass, with later more options like the Armor of Agility and the Unwanted Masterwork Armor. I mean, there's four of these, it's enough to supply your entire party with them. Don't forget, very early you can also go with, let's say, the Hide Armor plus two, which has an extra point of initiative as a bonus. Now, what about gear for our Cleric Tank Shadowheart? It's the same as I have in my guide for her. But to put it simply, early on you want Wapira's Crown for more healing potential, the Cloak of Protection 
for plus one to armor class, but you can also later go for the Cloak of Displacement if you prefer. For armors, it is very important that you go with the Luminous Armor, and you can find this super early by just going to the Goblin Fort, as it is the main source of Radiating Orb debuff whenever dealing Radiant damage to enemies, through either Radiance of the Dawn, your Domain Ability, or Spirit Guardians, the Cleric spell. Later, you can replace this for an armor that has better AC, the best one being the Armor of Agility. Or just skip to it, because when you are debuffing the enemy's attack rolls by such high amounts, it doesn't matter that you'll have slightly less AC. For gloves, you have multiple options, but ideally, early on, you want Hellrider's Pride to automatically buff all allies with Blade Ward besides yourself. From the second chapter onwards, you can also combine the Luminous Gloves with the Luminous Armor for even more Radiating Orb debuffs. And don't forget the Reviving Hands at Act 3, which is basically Hell Riders, but better. For boots, just a classic evasive shoes for higher AC. Early on, just go with the Amulet of Restoration for free casts of Healing Ward, but most importantly, Mass Healing Ward to auto buff allies with gear I already mentioned. Don't forget the Pearl of Power Amulet to restore a spell slot up to level 3, and that's where Spirit Guardians is. And of course, the Amulet of Greater Health at Act 3 for maximum tanking. For accessories, as always at Act 1, the Whispering Promise for Auto Blast on all allies when healing them. And you can go with the Ring of Protection, but this is not necessary at all. It's a bit of a pain to get, just one point of AC won't really matter. You can instead go for the Ring of Selving to increase your healing potential. Then for weapons, Fowler Aluve is a must-have for its Shriek ability. And guess what? It's also restored on a short rest, of which you have many with this party. Shriek reduces the enemy saving throws, which makes them easier to debuff, but most importantly, lets anyone that attacks the enemies do an extra 1 to 4 thunder damage per attack. And guess what? You also have 12 attacks per character. Just do the math, right? It definitely adds up. Followed by any shields like Viconia's Working Fortress later for the highest amount of AC. And I have the Hell Rider longbow on her for more initiative, but it's kinda overkill. Also, don't forget that because all of your characters, including the three swords bards, are spellcasters, one of them can also go with the spell DC boosting gear, like Hood of the Weave, Cloak of the Weave, the Proctati Sparks while Robe, Melv's First Staff, Catherick Shield, and so on. To increase your DC with spells like Glyph of Warding and also Hypnotic Pattern to the max. Like I said, this part is quite versatile and capable of multiple things, if you know what you're doing. Now, before finishing this guide, let's just do a quick section on how to properly play with this party. After all, in Iron Man you only have one chance. First, you always want to ambush enemies whenever you can, and in most battles you can do this, especially early on. Just wait by attacking them from stealth. This will surprise the enemies, which means one entire free turn for all party members, during which you'll destroy the entire enemy pack. For battles where you can't do that, well, that's why our party has high initiative, from either dexterity, feats, or gear boosts. What about when enemies ambush you? For example, the Beholder fight here. I assume that if you're playing it on honor mode, you kinda know where the enemies will spawn and which enemies can ambush you, but for example, it's gonna spawn around here. So I have Shadowheart separated from the rest of my party, because the Beholder can surprise you. So let's get it to spawn now. And there we go, we of course rolled extremely high with Shadowheart, ensuring we'll act first, because she does have high dexterity and alert. And because our party members are at the back, they are still out of battle, which means they were not surprised by the spectator despite not having the alert feat. Because we are hiding, we can now easily move all of our party members closer, so they can start attacking the spectator. Always be wary of the enemy's cone of vision, of course, so they won't detect you. The good thing is, the game is essentially frozen, right while Shadowheart is engaging battle with the enemy, so we can actually do almost anything with the rest of our party members. 
Now, depending on the enemy you are fighting, for example, if it's a boss, it helps you have Gale or whoever you have as a ranger, just like I said before, start with a Fog Cloud to force advantage on all party members' attacks against the enemy. Just be sure not to target Shadow Heart as well. The enemy is blinded, and the good thing is, by blinding them, it also completely removes their vision, so you can freely move your party members all over the place, and the enemy cannot detect them at all. Besides during combat. It will force Gale to start battle, however, but it doesn't matter. You can still attack with Dread Ambusher, and also your offhand attack. Sometimes you even get the main hand attack if you activate the turn based mode before casting Fog Cloud. Even the normal extra attack at level 5. Anyways, for your other main damage dealers, something very fun you can do is drop a candle on the ground. It does not cost anything whatsoever. Sometimes the candle itself won't be lit, but it doesn't matter because you can just click on it to light the candle. Once again, it doesn't cost anything for both dropping and lighting the candle. Then you want to dip your weapon. If you're dual wielding, both your hand crossbows will now have bonus fighter damage. Then don't forget to activate turn base mode so that you can ambush the enemy now with advantage and dual dipped extra fire damage. Because it's 1d4 per weapon and you have dual weapons, it does add up amazingly fast, especially early on when enemies don't have that high hit points. I mean, the spectator is almost dead already, and we still have an offhand attack. Always bonus fire damage. You essentially can just repeat this for almost any battle in the game. Oh, and don't forget, after battle ends, to pick your candle up. Otherwise, you might end up running out. I know because I always forget to do this. So it helps you split them and keep at least one candle for every party member. Now, what about our Shadow Heart? It's also very simple as a tank, buffer, debuffer, and healer. First, super early in the game, you definitely want to cast Bless on your party members. The higher your two hits chance, the better. But as soon as you hit level 5, you won't really care for Bless anymore, because you can just rely on the Whispering Promise Ring for the same purpose when healing allies automatically. And ideally, against tough enemies, you always want to start by using a bonus action and casting Mass Healing Word. We even have a Talisman for a free cast. When you do this, all party members are buffed with Bless and Blade Ward, so that even if the enemies dare attack your allies and they get hit, they'll take half damage only. That's why Hellrider's Pride is so useful. After that, you'll wanna activate the Fowler Aluve Shriek ability, ideally before battle starts as a means of pre-buffing because it does have enough duration, so that enemies will now take lots of extra damage per attack, no matter the source. Then it's time for Spirit Guardians, so let's cast that, and move close to the enemies of course, so they get hit with both damage and of course the Radiating Orb debuff. The closer the enemies are to one another, the more crippling the Radiating Orb will be. For the really powerful enemies, you should also be under haste, which means you can now activate Radiance of the Dawn in the same turn. For even more area of effect damage, so just look at that, the enemies have been crippled already, with huge radiating orb debuffs, minus 10. Which pretty much dooms them to never hit anyone. And well, by just passing your Shadow Heart, you'll be a walking bomb anyways. Lastly, don't forget that as far as haste, the best buff in the game, what you wanna do is always drop and throw a haste potion with allies close together, this way you can hit your entire party with haste for just one potion spent. Yes, it will cost a normal action, but you have one more from haste anyways. It's maximum efficiency when you consider we are crafting double haste potions per resource. Which is why I said before, your 20 potions you get at Act 1 can easily last you through the whole game. But you can always buy more from shopkeepers of course. 
And well, this was pretty much it from my ultimate honor mode best party for 100% win rate guide. If you found it useful as always, please remember to like, subscribe and also consider becoming a channel member if you can. I highly appreciate your support. Thank you for watching and see you next time friends, with more fun honor mode builds.